move on here to our next hand, and this is going to be from a 5-5 game. So this is moving down to a 5-5 game, but they're playing it with a straddle in this particular hand, and they had been playing this knight a lot with a straddle, so sometimes it's 5-5-10 with a little bit of um, shorter stacks. I was considering blurring out one of the hands because, you know, I get a lot of positive feedback um, sometimes when I do that, but this hand was so unbelievable from really from both sides um, talking about value that I wanted to keep them open because, you know, it could have been like blurring one and then blurring the other, but we're going to look at both perspectives like we, we did before uh, in some of the other hands. Now here we've got a straddle from UTG in this guy, John. And Sean, who doesn't really play from what I've seen, like crazy loose, decides to make a crazy loose open here in this straddle pot from under the gun one plus one with five deuce offsuit and you can see that he only has about four hundred and fifteen dollars so that is actually quite uh it's actually accurate um again the red chips are fives the greens are 25s we're gonna see richard make a pretty tight just call here or excuse me, Rick, make a pretty tight just call here with um, with Ace-King. Um, you know, again, playing at what is the equivalent of 5-5-10, five, five, um, only about 40 big blinds deep. Um, it can be a little bit odd and tricky, 40 big blinds deep in a cash game, because a lot of times you put that third bet in, a guy isn't going to really get it all in with you unless they have a pair or they have ace-king themselves unless they're crazy. And maybe they get it in with like an ace-queen or something like that. That's why actually this is a good stack in a cash game to actually three-bet bluff and then fold to a ship because you put so much leverage on um, the other guy. They basically have to commit all their chips or fold. But um, ace-king can be a little bit tricky at the stack depth, uh, like right around 50 big blinds because of the range that somebody gets in. Rick decides to call here, and that's not obviously the reason why I picked this handout, but we're going to talk about um, what to do here with these hands, with these stack sizes, and if we were deeper. So if I flat with Ace-King, I'm pretty happy with this board here, and I'm thinking about, all right, well, we only started with about 400 bucks. How am I going to get the most amount of money in here? Rick checks, and Sean's going to make a continuation bet, which I think is fine here. Um, you're not really going to get called by worse, but it's certainly a bluff. It's actually a form of a semi-bluff. Um, he doesn't really have the best hand here now, but he actually could improve. And there's a fair chance he might get a lot of better hands to fold, like pocket sixes, pocket sevens, maybe even any hand that's not an ace. Now, with these stack sizes, I'm not exactly sure what Rick's you know image is. Like, if he's the tightest guy in the world where he breathes on a pot and people fold then um, I could certainly see calling here because you don't want to see your opponent fold. But let's take this from a neutral perspective. Let's just say that your image is, is somewhat neutral or you're an unknown. I would click this right now. You're out of position. So, I mean, you could play a check call lead here on the turn so that it doesn't go check check. Like if you call here, the pot will be 185 and the guy's got about 365 left, two pot size bets left. You don't want it to go check check on the turn, but I think the trick here when playing against short stacks, just to raise it small, make it like 110. And then that's gonna guarantee you, like if you make it 110 here, the pot's gonna be about 300. The guy's gonna have about 300 left, and you can just follow that up with like quarter pot size, quarter pot size, almost to get all the money in, um, with one pot size bet left, or quarter to half, or something like that. Just small bets with two streets left will get it done. So I probably would have just like min clicked this up, like I said, unless I had some sort of crazy, crazy, um, you know, tight image for some reason. If I'm the foreman, Rick, Rick just kind of nonchalantly calls, and again, we're gonna look at this from both perspectives now. Pretty incredible turn here for Sean. Um, and again, from a neutral perspective, let's say that Rick is an unknown. Let's shift our our thoughts to what I would do in Sean's spot. You can see the flop doesn't really have any draws on it, like, at all. Um, I mean, yeah, there's, like, a straight draw, like, 6-7 or 7-8, but you're not going to get that type of action anyways here on the turn. Um, the guy might have a nine, but again, you're not really going to get a ton of action from that anyways. 
Um, and because you have a 5, he doesn't really have a 5 here almost ever. So what's the next logical hand that he has when he flat calls your raise out of the small blind and check calls the flop? Duh, it's an ace. Um, I wouldn't have thought that his hand was as good as ace-king, but it's pretty obvious that he's going to have an ace here. Like I said, we don't have to worry about any of the other hands. They're just going to fold out. We want to go max value against an ace, and that's really the key to um, you know, figuring out and looking at your opponent's hand and then, you know, understanding that no limits about your opponent's range, not necessarily your own cards, besides the fact here that we just know we have the best hand. So now, if Rick checks to us and we're Sean and the pot's 185 and we've got 365 left, we've got about two pot size bets left. If we were to bet like 100 here and the guy called, the pot would now be 385 and we have about 265 left. Um, so under a pot size bet, I would probably bet 120 here then the pot would be 420 and i'd have about 240 left and i can set up a shove um you might go a t tad bit more maybe 125 something like that and then you can set up a shove that would be my entire plan here if i'm sean there is it's inexcusable to not get all the money in here versus an ace when you turn trip fives in a straddle pot where you only started about 40 big blinds of 40, 45 big blinds effective against the straddle. So it's all going to be about bet sizing. You've got to choose your sizing on the turn that will lead to a river all in. So Rick is going to check here out of the small blind and Sean is going to make a very small bet, which I am not a fan of. I think he bets 40 or 50, he bets 50 again. And of course, the reason why I'm not a fan of that is because of the fact that he's not going to be able to get all the money in unless he makes a gross shove all in on the river, which he could do. But that's going to get a result less like less often of a call from a mediocre ace than it is if you were to just bet kind of normal on the turn to set it up with a shove. Now, from Rick's perspective here on the turn, if I were to just call, the problem now is, is that he bet 50 on the flop we just called. He bet 50 on the turn. Usually that size of a bet on the turn is kind of what I like to call like almost like a showdown bet, meaning that he's betting the same amount that he did the street before, and he's going to check back the river. So you can't let him, you can't just call. Now, obviously, we know that Rick doesn't have the best hand, but I'm trying to play it like we don't know Sean's hand. I'm trying to go into both perspectives. We've got a pretty big mistake in sizing here by Sean by only betting 50 on turn, and a pretty big mistake in not check-raising turn now if we're Rick, because if we call, if you don't bet the river, the guy's just going to check it back. Now, you could call and then bet the river, but you're not getting all the money, and like I said, I still like a click. Click it up to 110. If you make it 110 and the guy had like a weaker ace or something like that, you know, you'd be looking at a pot of about 400 and he'd have about 250 left, just kind of like that sweet spot that we talked about from Sean's perspective of betting 110 in position. There's no way that I would just call if I had just called the flop. You know what I mean? And now the river comes a backdoor diamond. So if I did just check call, if I was right, I'm definitely betting the river because I expected to get checked through so much. So it's a really, really strange way that Rick played this particular hand. Now, for Sean here, once it, you know, another thing that we actually didn't discuss that becomes somewhat relevant here on the turn is, and, and the fact that I, the why I'm not a huge fan of that small bet size is that if a guy has a mediocre ace um, on the turn, now that the board's paired, if a high card comes. His kicker's not going to play, meaning that he would be, if, if he thinks you have an ace, he would be calling for a chop, which makes it even less likely that he's going to call an all-in as a bet, because people don't like to call all-ins all -ins as, you know, four chops. Now, I love this play if I think that, my, if I'm Sean and, like, I had a hand like ace-10 here, and I think my opponent has a weak ace, I would love moving all-in and try to get him off of a chop. Um, but for, for pure value with five deuce, you don't want that to happen. You want to get called by an ace. That's why you need to, to bet bigger on the turn. You know, the river rolls off here, backdoor diamonds. He hasn't really built the pot up here. I mean, you got to bet at least 150, but I would have been betting much, much larger. And like I said, if I'm Rick, I'm playing this hand entirely different too. Um, Rick is going to check here. And I believe that Sean actually does make a substantial size bet. I think he bets about 150. So he makes up for a little bit of value. But, I mean, if you put me in Sean's spot, 
I'm getting all of the money in. <laughs> There's no way in the war, nowhere in the world am I ever, ever, ever leaving 165, um, you know, behind here. Um, and that's just, you know, it just is what it is. Now, the crazy part of this hand is this is why the blurring wouldn't have worked. I have no idea what Rick is thinking, but Rick is actually going to fold here. So it would have looked bizarre if I had blurred Rick's hand out and been like, I can't believe Sean left so much money on the table and then Rick folds ace-king. There's nothing I can really say about that. I don't understand how ace-king can be played that way. Um, I don't know if they know each other really, really well. It's really, really strange. But I'm just saying from Sean's perspective, he's got to get more value in there from what would be probably 98% of the player pool calling down larger bets with an ace. And for Rick's perspective, from out of position, he's got to basically get more money in there from what with, with what is a nut hand, too, in the form of ace-king. So value lost by both players, and then Rick ends up folding ace-king, ace which is quite, quite bizarre.